mention from what city you are listening to us. Uh, we always like to know where you are from. So if you can hear us, then we know. Uh, and if you type, we know that, uh, that we're live. I see someone is typing. So I'll just wait until I see. Yes, okay, great. Uh, we can, you can hear us, wonderful. My name is Jerke Verschoor, uh, Director of the Netherlands Education Support Office, and I'm here with my colleague, Jelena Cipanina, and she's the curator of the Dutch Science Talks. Now, as most of you or some of you might know, our office works on intensifying the academic bonds between Russia and the Netherlands, student mobility, uh, and we try to connect universities. Um, but these Dutch Science Talks, we organize with support of the Netherlands Embassy in Russia, and tonight we have a very interesting and important topic to discuss. A topic that addresses us all and a topic, or I rather say a problem that we are all part of. Household food waste. Uh, tonight, Professor Erika van Herpen will uh, start the lecture. She works at uh, Wageningen University and Research, which is the only university in the Netherlands to focus specifically on the theme of healthy food and living environment. Uh, the research of uh, Professor Van Herpen focuses on consumer decisions in retail and in-home settings. Now, after her lecture, we will welcome Anton Gubnitsin. He is the CEO of TR Center, an independent think tank and advisory firm. They assist corporations and government bodies to implement the principles of sustainable development effectively in their running of businesses and regions. Anton will tonight focus on the challenges of food waste and opportunities of food sharing in Russia. Now, after both their uh, lectures, uh, Jelena and myself will moderate a Q&A. So if you have questions during or after the lectures, please write them down in the chat and we will discuss them at the end of the lecture. Uh, now, I would like to welcome Professor Van Herpen. Uh, please turn on your video and your microphone. And I'm wishing all attendees a very enjoyable evening. <laughs> and feel free to ask as many questions as you want in the chat. Uh, hello, Erika. I can see you. Hi. Good. And I can hear you. So I will turn off my sound and my video. And the floor is yours. Thank you. I will uh, start sharing my screen as well so that people can also see uh, the slides. So, uh, welcome everybody. It's really great that you're all here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about household food waste, uh, the drivers of household food waste, so what determines household food waste. And, um, I'm also going to focus on one specific intervention study that we're currently doing. Just a sec. So, food waste is a big issue. And um, According to uh, FWO and, and, and sort of standards, we know that about a third of all the food that's produced is being wasted. And of course, that's a big number, that a third of the food that we grow for human consumption goes to waste. Um, we all want to uh, lower that number, of course. And a lot of the food waste that's happening actually occurs in households. Uh, so a lot of the food waste that uh, goes on goes on in consumers' homes which is a difficult part of the uh, whole chain to address. It's also really important because uh, once the food is in your home and you have it there, it's gone through all the phases and, and, and all of the supply chain and it's uh, you know, incorporated uh, all the, uh, it, it has as much impact on uh, the environment as, as possible almost if you throw it out because it has been transported, it has been packaged, um, Lots of natural resources has, have gone to waste if you throw it out in your house. So in this talk, what I want to do is uh, talk to you about why people waste food, what we know about that, what the main determinants are of household food waste, and also talk about one possible solution, an intervention, uh, which we've developed, uh, uh, which focuses on getting people to take home doggy bag from restaurants. So that is a setting where there's plate waste in a restaurant, and um, it's you know, a waste if it gets thrown out. So it would be nice if people actually uh, take it home and eat it there. So, um, the, by the way, the first part of my talk, the one uh, on why people waste food and determinants, is based on research that we've done before and it has mostly been published. So I'll also share with you um, where you can find more information about it. Uh, the latter part, the intervention, is a work in progress that we're currently working on. and 
you know, if at any point uh, you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I also like to hear your opinions about you know, how we can improve the, uh, the research that we're doing. So very happy to, uh, to hear your comments. So the first question that we asked ourselves when we started our research on, on food waste uh, already many years ago is why people actually waste food. Um, it doesn't seem very uh, logical to do, but um, one of the reasons that keeps popping up, up if you talk to people or if you even look at literature is that it's being said that we live in this throwaway society. Um, it's mentioned that we have an excess wanton nature of contemporary consumerism. So that means that we really don't seem to care so much anymore. Um, it's quite easy and, and uh, to throw some food away and, and it seems as if consumers really do not care about it that much. Now, the first question that we had is that really the case? Do people not care about it? And you may want to think about that and put in the chat uh, whether you think that people care about food waste or not. So um, that's at least the first question that we had. And when we looked in the literature and also when we look across our own uh, research, we find that wasting is actually not so careless or carefree as we may think. Turns out that consumers do seem to care. And we find that, for instance, in uh, research looking at uh, how consumers go through their day-to-day -day life. So this is qualitative research um, where we find evidence that consumers try to attempt, in, attempt to lessen anxieties about discarding food. For instance, you would have people saying, OK, I have something in my fridge. I know I'm not going to eat it, but it's, it's, it's still OK to eat. So I'll wait with throwing it out until it's gone moldy, because by that time, if I throw it out, I don't feel so bad anymore. Couldn't have, couldn't eat it anymore anyways. So that is one way to try to lessen your anxieties about discarding food. So it means, in, a, in effect, that people do care about it at some point. They don't want to throw away good food. People also describe themselves as worrying and feeling guilty about wasting. So there's, for instance, that letter paper that, that I refer to here, the one from Greece, uh, um, Abiliotis. Um, in his survey, and I think 95% of the respondents said that they felt guilty about wasting. So at least consumers themselves say that they care about it. Also, consumers tend to favor options with less waste. So if you can choose between options, um, they will pick for options that imply less waste, even if it costs a little bit more money. Or an alternative way of looking at it, people can forgo free food and drink uh, because they're worried about wasting. it. So if you have a promotion that you can take any size of soft drink, for instance, for the same price, whether it's small or medium or large, people do not always take the large one, even though that would be you know, the most for the money that you, you're spending. But if they think, oh, I'm not going to drink that all, they will take the one that they think they will actually drink. So they, they forgo free food or drink. Uh, in order not to waste. So all these examples show that people do care about wasting. At the same time, we throw away a lot of our food uh, at home, so our behaviors don't seem to match this. So what is happening then? Um, well, it turns out that these feelings of dissonance that people have uh, can affect uh, later on, uh, also attitudes, for instance. So people also themselves uh, feel this, this difference between actually wasting something and not wanting to waste. And that creates a negative feeling, which we call dissonance. And if uh, in a situation where the brand is visible at the waste occasion, so when you're throwing something out, for instance, in this packaging, but still part of the product is left and you, the, you know, the brand is visible there, then it might lead to attitudes change, is what we show in our paper, so that people don't like the brand that much anymore, because that's the easiest way to resolve the feeling of dissonance. Oh, I don't want to waste, but I'm wasting it. Well, it must have not have been that good a product. Right? That's easier than to say, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a bad person for wasting it. People don't want to draw that conclusion. Um, now, we've also delved into this in, uh, as part of a research project in an EU project called Refresh. And what we've done there, among many other things, is that we've done focus groups in four countries across Europe, the Netherlands, Hungary, Germany, and Spain. We did six focus groups per country, so you know, quite a lot of people uh, 
uh, for a qualitative study, um, delving into the issue of why do people actually uh, waste food and what is going on there, what are the considerations that they have. Uh, we also looked into how can we measure uh, food waste uh, in an accurate way. And we did a survey in the same four countries where we had many more households fill in the survey, um, also use this measure of, of, uh, of household food waste that we developed to see what you know, types of factors actually determine uh, this household food waste. And I want to run you through the main results from this. So first, the part on that wasting is not carefree for consumers. We also find that when we look at our qualitative research or the focus group. Uh, I have a couple of quotes here of people who uh, say the, something in this respect. So here's the first one. Uh, this is a person from uh, Germany who says that every time he throws something in the trash, he feels like he's throwing away a five euro note. So that clearly emphasizes the financial part of it. There's other people who, uh, for whom the financial part isn't the important part, but for whom it's uh, much more of a moral issue almost. So there was one participant saying that it doesn't really hurt my pocket, so I don't care about the money, but it hurts my soul. That's you know something big, but still people waste. And that's a weird contradiction, right? So um, I think that's best illustrated by the last quote that I have on the slide. This is one partic participant, and uh, that person says, wasting is not acceptable to me at all. But, you know, if it happens from time to time, then it happens. That seems a big contradiction, right? It's not acceptable, but yeah, well, when it happens, it happens. So what is going on then? What we find in this paper is that, you know, waste prevention is not the main goal of consumers. It's like collateral damage. Uh, it happens along the way. People don't want it, but you know, it happens. And if um, uh, we then ask about you know, why that's happening, it's like an unintended consequence of balancing these other goals that people have. So they have a, a goal to have uh, convenient uh, meals, to eat healthily, uh, to eat tasty food. They have all these different goals related to food, and you know, waste prevention is not the main one among them. And food waste as a general concept is seen as something very negative. So in general, people are opposed to food waste. But when we talk about everyday life, then what we hear back is different. Then people start to talk like in that quote about, yeah, you know, from time to time it happens. You, you can't prevent it completely. So in general, people are against food waste. But in their day-to-day -day businesses, they seem to accept or trivialize that it's happening. So we see actually a lot of trivialization going on, like, oh, it isn't that much, or um, you know, it's, it, 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 it won't have that, that big of a consequence, or it doesn't cost that much. Those types of trivializations we also hear back. Um, what we also found from our uh, uh, you know, analysis of these focus groups that I thought was interesting uh, to share is that there are these barriers to learning or applying skills. So uh, this again um, boils down to the goal conflict that people have. So some people will say, okay, I know that I'll probably uh, waste less if I plan better, but then there's the spontaneity in, in, in you know, deciding what to cook and, and, and cooking. So people don't want to do that. Or for instance, the, per the, the person who is saying that, you know, she knows that if she would put her apples and pears into the refrigerator, they would last longer, but he wants to put them out uh, at the counter in the, in the kitchen so that the kids at least see them and there's more chance that they'll eat them. So uh, the, the, you know, providing for the family and ensuring that they eat healthily is more important than food waste. So there's again that goal conflict. So this, this actually is then uh, a barrier in, 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 in you know, uh, incorporating uh, food management behaviors in the home that will limit food waste. Um, in our research on this uh, topic, we've taken a social marketing approach. That means that we're looking at uh, motivation, ability, and opportunity. So here we're, we're, we're looking at uh, not just are people motivated not to waste, but also what are their skills and the knowledge that they have? Does that influence food waste? What are the opportunities in the environment to diminish food waste? Uh, do people have a freezer or not, for instance? But also, um, you know, are stores close by? 
or uh, do they have a lot of unforeseen events in their life that they have to deal with? Those are the opportunities. And whether people are able to manage their you know, household food in a way that diminishes food waste depends on all three. Um, and like I'm, what I just mentioned, it's, it's, it's the household management that's important. So these things affect food waste, but what's in between are these household practices. How do people actually uh, manage their household food uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Where do they store? How do they store? Do they plan? Do they make shopping lists? Those types of things. And that's then uh, mediating the effects of these uh, more elements on household food waste. So the um, survey that they, we did, and like I mentioned before, we had four European countries. We looked at the determinants of food waste and we used the self-report measure of food waste. We developed this measure um, separately in separate studies where we also looked at how well it correlated with other measures because we were kind of worried in the beginning whether we could develop a measure for um, food waste that's self-reported and actually accurate because many people don't realize how much they're wasting. But we were able to develop a, a survey measure that correlated quite well with uh, other measures like uh, diaries or where people put their waste in a, a kitchen caddy and then we collected and we weigh it or where people made photographs that we then coded. And um, the survey measure that we developed um, actually correlates quite well, but it does underreport. So in general, we will see that um, the amount of food waste that a household generates in, in you know, any of these other measures is higher than what they report in the survey. But for the, our purpose of finding these determinants, it doesn't matter so much as long as you know, the, the, uh, the survey measure can distinguish between households that waste a lot versus households that waste little. And it seemed you know, well able to do so. So what does this self-report food waste measure look like? Um, well, people get this uh, long list of all food categories that they just need to click like, what did you uh, throw out in the past week? And then for each of the ones that they click, they get a follow-up question asking them how much they wasted in units that they can relate to. So for instance, with the fruit, it's a piece of fruit or you know, a, a portion of fruit. Um, with um, you know, vegetables, it could be a, a serving spoon, how many serving spoons they wasted. And then we later on uh, recalculate that in terms of grants. And there's a, a reference at the bottom in case you're interested in it. There's this uh, survey is available, uh, complete survey there. What were the results of this survey? When we looked at the motivational elements, uh, what's most striking is that the descriptive norm, so what others do, what people think others do, had a really huge effect on uh, their own behavior, on their own household food waste. So if people think that others waste a lot, they also tend to waste more. Um, what's also striking is that the awareness of consequences of wasting had no significant effect. So if people were aware that you know, the food that they're wasting actually hurts the environment, that did not mean that they would waste less or, or more. It just had no significant effect. Um, that's especially striking because if you think of the campaigns that we have, uh, a lot of it uh, actually, at, at least up till a few years ago, uh, really emphasized how bad it was to waste food, which apparently doesn't really do that much. And to make matters worse, uh, some of the campaigns that we've seen in the past actually seem to communicate the wrong social norm, the wrong descriptive norm. For instance, this one from the US, it says that every American wastes uh, 290 pounds of food a year. Now that's a, a descriptive norm. This is what people apparently do. So if we think that others waste a lot, we might waste a lot too. Or not try to restrict ourselves so much because we think, oh, if, if they're wasting so much, then I'm still fine. That's at least the response I had when I saw um, um, an, an, a campaign of the European Union is this. This is from maybe you know, quite some years ago. They've, they've uh, changed that campaign since then. Uh, but it was... Uh, um, a campaign that they had is part of a movie. This is one screenshot that I took. And in that campaign, you saw people sort of looking sad at all the food that was being wasted. And whenever I see this image, I'm thinking of you know, my son, who's you know, by now older than, uh, than the kid in, in there. But when he was younger, he would not, he will be a picky eater, but not as bad as this one. So we're fine, right? We don't have to worry about food waste if other people are doing this. And that's the problem when we're uh, um, communicating a descriptive norm that's 
not what we want people to do. So that's something we, we, we should probably avoid. Um, then other results that we got from the um, uh, survey, and this is related to the abilities, to so the skills and the knowledge that people have. And there we see that if people have more skills and knowledge, they will waste less. That seems quite, uh, you know, in line with expectations. We also find the facts for opportunity. And here it's uh, insightful that um, the prevalence of unforeseen events, so how often there's a change in planning, actually had a big effect on household food waste and that it increased food waste. So uh, people seem to have especially problems in this, this, this planning um, when they have these unforeseen events. So those were the main effects from uh, uh, you know, that study. And like I said, there's, there's papers and, and online sources that uh, you can go to if you want to know more about this. Um, and I want to switch to one of the uh, working progress that we're working on. One of the interventions that we've uh, uh, recently been working on has to do with doggy bags. Um, and we're trying to break a social norm there. So, this study is, is set in the Netherlands, um, and the norms surrounding uh, doggy bags or taking leftover food home in a restaurant are very cultural specific. Uh, but it seems that the difference between Russia and the Netherlands in this respect is, is, is not as huge. Um, in the US, for instance, there's a vastly different social norm. So if, if I'm talking about this to people from the US, I always have to explain like, you know, in Europe, it's not common to take home your leftover food from a restaurant. Whereas in the U.S., that's that's perfectly natural and common to do. And uh, their um, waitress is actually act surprised if you don't want to take food home. Here it's the other way around, right? So um, at least in the Netherlands, it's the case that if you go into a restaurant and there's food left on your plate, it's uh, you know you, you you sit down to eat. It's not a takeaway restaurant. You sit down to eat. There's food left on your plate. Then the most common thing to do is to just leave it there and not to ask for a doggy bag to take it home. And we want to break that behavior. Um, of course, it's you know solving it after the fact. Um, and this intervention should not stand alone. Um, it's obviously better if we can uh, prevent there from being leftover food on the plate. But we also know that there will be occasions when there's leftover food because we cannot always uh, perfectly predict. Um, and for people, there's a uh, this apparent conflict in uh, when it comes to this uh, leftover food. Because on the one hand, if you decide to ask for a doggy bag, there would be shame generated by going against a social norm, doing something that's not common. On the other hand, if you act according to the social norm and not take the doggy bag, um, you're actually leaving food to waste, and, and that's non-sustainable behavior. That's not, not nice. And then you can feel guilty about that. Um, so there, there seems to be this conflict in emotions there. Um, in order to, to solve that or to, to change that, we were looking at um, choice architecture to help us do that, especially at the opt-in, opt-out uh, options that there are, and what is the default. So people generally prefer the default option, what's you know, commonly done or what's, what, what everybody does. Um, yet changing this default um, could then help, but could also activate persuasion. What do I mean by that? Well, if you uh, would change, uh, in this case, the, uh, uh, the doggy bags from um, you're not getting one unless you ask for it to you're getting one unless you say no, then people might feel that they're being pressured into taking the doggy bag. And they might realize that you're trying to influence them. And they may not li always like that. People don't generally like being influenced in an overt way. So we have a, a possible solution for that that we wanted to test. And that is what we call offering subordinate options. Um, I, you can also call it an opt-out with choices. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, that this means that uh, we're going to give people an, um, an opportunity, uh, or we're going to give them the, the, the choice between different types of doggy bags. But regardless of which one they chose, they'll get one. Um, I've actually, the reason that, or, or how I came up with this option, um, 
it relates way back to when my kids were smaller. Um, if you have small kids have been in contact with small kids, you may know that they go to these, through these phases and they have the terrible twos. Um, a terrible twos is what the English call it. It's when the, the kids are roughly two or three years old, they have usually this phase where they say no to everything because they want to test their boundaries and, and get their own opinion out. So no. But there are things that you know we want them to do. So one of my colleagues actually said, well, you, you should give them choices, but where every whatever they choose, is it's OK. So if you put them in the car and they don't want to, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing is about wearing a, a seatbelt in the car, you can say, oh, do you want to put on your seatbelt or will mommy put on your seatbelt? And they have a choice. But whatever they choose, that seatbelt goes on. And this is basically, um, the, the study is me trying to see if this also works with adults in the context of doggy bag. So we're giving people a choice. Do you want a plastic doggy bag or a paper doggy bag? That's basically it. And because they start thinking about you know, which doggy bag do I want, they enter what is called in the literature a comparative mindset. And they don't realize that there's also the option to say, oh, no, I don't want a doggy bag. So they get sort of locked into this decision. Um, they still feel that there's freedom. They, they can choose. And um, whatever they choose, they go home with the doggy bag, which is what we wanted anyways. Um, so that's the, uh, the opt-out with choices option that we have in here. So we're looking at these different influence strategies, the, you know, the normal situation where you have to ask for a doggy bag compared to one uh, where we just offer them a choice. You know, we want a doggy bag or not, more explicit. Compared to really changing that uh, uh, to an opt-out situation where here's your doggy bag unless you say no. And compared to paper or plastic doggy bag, which one do you want? Now, what we think is that these influence strategies, what we use will, oh, sorry, that was wrong button this time, uh, will influence the feelings of shame that people feel. Because shame is probably the, um, the emotion that people feel when they're taking a doggy bag, but if they're not the one having to ask for it, uh, but it's offered to them, or, um, then that feeling of shame is likely to diminish. Um, at the same uh, time, we think that these influence strategies were also influence the perceived limit, limited freedom of choice. So especially in that situation where it's an opt out. So here's your doggy bag, unless you say no, that people will think uh, that their choice, their freedom of choice gets limited. And we think that these have important effects on uh, managerially relevant outcomes, such as whether people actually take that doggy bag, but also how they evaluate the restaurant and the waitress. And one final thing that we're interested in is also whether people consume the leftover food from that doggy bag. Because you know, basically the worst thing that could happen is that through our influence strategies, we get people to take home um, the food in a doggy bag and they then to throw all everything out. So they're not just wasting the food, but also the container it's in. That would be the worst outcome because then uh, we're actually increasing waste instead of decreasing it. So we wanted to see whether people actually consumed from it. And we have a set of studies that I want to take you through uh, where we looked into this. Um, so first one is, what is the norm uh, on doggy bags? So the first experiment is what we set up is just to show people that, hey, at least in the Dutch situation, uh, most people do not take a doggy bag, uh, basically to persuade those people from the US that this actually is the case here be because they're used to a different situation. There's a cultural effect here. Um, so what we did is we had uh, students read a scenario in which they um, imagined that they were eating out uh, with their family. It was a three group design, so uh, uh, within subjects. So they, they were asked to rate um, how would they feel about eating the remaining food if that's left over on their plate. Uh, so they're all asked to imagine eating out with a family, the food tastes good, but they're full. And then what if you would still eat it? What if you would leave it on the plate? What if you would ask for a doggy bag? We ask for their feelings about that, how they feel. And we ask um, um, their, uh, um, what, what they think other people would do, what most people would do, so the descriptive norm. So um, what would others do? Um, people say that 
some people might eat it. Lots of people will probably leave it on their plate and waste it. Only very few people thought that others would uh, ask for a, a doggy bag to take the food home. So it's clearly the case that taking food home is not the social norm. Most people will not do that, but people think. How would you feel? We asked for different emotions. I put three of them here, uh, shame, guilt, and pride. Um, the blue bars are uh, related to uh, taking the doggy bag. And what you see is that uh, things like guilt or pride, um, guilt is actually pretty low in terms of uh, when you take a doggy bag, so people don't feel guilty. They do feel proud. Um, so those are all positive things in terms of taking the doggy bag. But the main problem seems to be in shame. People feel ashamed of taking the doggy bag. And shame is exactly that feeling that results from not you know, doing what others are doing, uh, acting. Uh, outside of you know what you ex your social group expects of you, so that illustrates the problem here. So this uh, study shows that wasting is the norm. That taking a doggy bag has has positive effects on consumers' emotional state compared to wasting, except for sh shame. So shame is the issue. Now. Um, in the next study, we wanted to look at the influence attempts and just to refresh your memory, what we have is that we either explicitly offer the sustainable option as a viable alternative. So we say, do you want a doggy bag? Yes or no? Or we present a sustainable option as default. That's the opt out. Here you have it. Or we offer subordinate sustainable options that imply this default. So that's the opt out uh, with choice. You want paper or plastic doggy bag? But you'll take a doggy bag, assuming that. So in the second experiment, we wanted to look at the actual behavior. Do people take this doggy bag, yes or no? And this was a lab study. So we had students in our lab. This was all done, by the way, before the coronavirus uh, came up. Nowadays, we don't have these lab studies uh, possibilities. Um, we had students uh, taste test uh, bite-sized crackers. Um, they had two different flavors. Um, they first taste tested it and said uh, you know, the, the extent to which they liked it. They had an unrelated uh, second survey to fill in and they could eat a little bit more. But we make sure they had so much that they wouldn't eat it all. I think there were three or four people in this uh, experiment who did eat everything and we left them out of the analysis. But rough, most people did not eat everything. And then we had these leftovers and we had a four group design where people on the piece of paper that they were given, uh, it was mentioned that um, there were doggy bags that was, you, you could take it home. And there were four conditions. So one condition had to write down, yes, I want to take them home. Uh, the other condition, there was a question, do you want to take them home, yes or no? And they just had to tick that one. Uh, then they had an option of, um, we will give you the leftovers to take home. If you don't want that, please write down, I don't want that. And the last condition was one where we uh, asked them, you know, uh, you can take these uh, crackers home. Do you want uh, paper or plastic uh, bag to take it home? And they could take which one. Um, and then we looked at, you know, how many people actually took that doggy back home. What it turns out is that in the control condition, about a third of the people took the time to write down, I want to take these crackers home. Remember, these are students. This is free food for them. You would expect you know, quite a few people to say, yeah, I want to take them. Uh, in our case, that was about a third. Then if you're giving the choice of just check marking, yes, I want to take it home, um, that didn't really do that much. Roughly equal, uh, not significantly different. If they had to write them, I don't want to take them home, however, we had many more people actually taking the doggy bag, about 70%. And then if they were given a choice between paper and plastic and had to take which one, uh, we also had roughly the same similar uh, number of people taking uh, the food home. And you know, when a session was done, the people who were in that session would come for and uh, the research assistant would check what they had opted for and they actually got the food to take home also if they opted for that. So it's, this was not a hypothetical choice. They actually got to take the crackers home. Um, now, this is, of course, nice to see as uh, you know, these influence strategies affect our 
final outcome measure of taking the doggy bag. Uh, but we also wanted to see what goes on in, uh, as a process in between, whether we're right that this, uh, these strategies actually diminish uh, the, the feeling of shame, and whether we're also right um, that uh, choice freedom might be at stake here. Um, in our third experiment, we therefore did a, um, a scenario study. Um, we asked people to imagine taking a doggy back home after having been exposed to an influence strategy versus a control where they asked for it themselves. So in all cases, people read a, a story about you know, going to a restaurant, having a very nice dinner, uh, but having some leftover food, and then deciding to actually, in one case, ask for a doggy bag and take it home. In another case, have the waitress come up to you and ask if you wanted a doggy bag and answering yes and taking the food home. Or in the third case, the waitress comes up to you and you, uh, and, and uh, you know, unsolicited provides you the food in the doggy bag and you take it home. And in the fourth case, the uh, waitress asks you, do you want it in a plastic or a paper doggy bag? And uh, you choose one and you take it home. So in all cases, um, the assumption is that, you know, People have to imagine actually taking it home, but after different influence strategies. Uh, these were Dutch consumers, not students, but uh, a representative sample of the Netherlands. Uh, we measured their feeling of shame. We also measured the perceived limitation in choice freedom that they felt. Uh, we also asked them how they evaluated the restaurant and the waitress. Results, um, results for shame are uh, that you know, in control conditions, people feel some degree of shame. It's not really high. It's not as if you go like, oh my God, I asked for a doggy bag. How could I have done that? No, but you feel a little bit uncomfortable about it. Then, um, you know, in the other conditions where they were asked if they wanted a doggy bag or where the waitress gave them a doggy bag, uh, the shame is a lot less. So these influence strategies seem to work that they uh, uh, diminish the felt shame uh, because people don't have to ask for the doggy bag. Then we also looked at perceived freedom of choice. And there we see that that is lowest in the situation and significantly lower than in the other conditions in the, that condition where uh, they were given the doggy bag by default. So where the waitress would unsolicited, put everything in a doggy bag and present you with the doggy bag. That's a situation where people feel that they're being influenced and they don't have the, uh, the choice freedom anymore. And that's also the situation where they evaluated the waitress a little less positively. So they liked the waitress a little less when the waitress sort of forced the doggy back on them. Okay. Um, so what we conclude from this is that all these influence strategies appear effective in uh, diminishing shame. Um, but the opt out of uh, doggy back by default also decreases perceived choice freedom and the evaluation of the waitress. So that seems like not the best solution to take in this case, although you know, wait until I show you the results of the next study, but for now. And then um, the opt-out opt out with choices, uh, choice between types of doggy bags, although it also influences them into taking a doggy bag, people don't feel that uh, their choice freedom is taken away so much, and it doesn't have these detrimental effects. Um, then, Moving on to the fourth experiment of actual food waste. So, so far we've done scenario studies or lab experiments, but we also wanted to test this in an actual situation. Um, and this was a, a university cafeteria, um, a restaurant setting where there were uh, students invited to participate. They would be given a lunch and uh, the same, you know, intervention as we had before. On the picture, you see the lunch. I'm not sure what a typical Russian lunch is, but I'm pretty sure that it's not this, because uh, you know every uh, foreign person I've talked to uh, who's ever visited the Netherlands or taken them to lunch um, asks like, really, is this what you're having for lunch? Yes, this is the type of lunch that we have in the Netherlands. We have um, sandwiches, uh, something to put on it. We have some fruit here even. Uh, and we drink milk or um, orange juice or um, uh, buttermilk. That was the choice that participants were given. So participants would enter this uh, cafeteria, be greeted by a research assistant who acted as a waitress. Um, she would you know, guide them to a table. 
um, all the participants would sit um, dispersed across the, re uh, the restaurant so that um, they couldn't interact with each other. And there were other visitors sitting in that canteen as well. Um, now they were given their free lunch and in the meantime asked to uh, you know, fill in a few surveys. A part of that was just you know, part of the cover story, so they didn't, re didn't realize what we're really interested in, but part of it was also an evaluation of the waitress, an evaluation of the restaurant that we were interested in. Um, they were also evaluated after um, they had finished eating and after the doggy bag uh, treatment was done. So what we did with the, the, the doggy bag treatments is the same as before, basically. So um, on their survey uh, of where they filled out how much they liked the food, um, it was mentioned that they could ask for a doggy bag. And in the control condition, that was it. So they could ask for a doggy bag. They had to ask for it really to, to uh, have the, to, to obtain it. Then it was a situation where the waitress would come up and say, hey, you have some leftovers. Shall I put it in a doggy bag? And again, we made sure that there was more food than they could handle. So there were almost, yeah, well, actually always leftovers. Um, then we had the situation where the waitress uh, would come up and say, oh, I see you have some food left over. I'll put it in a doggy bag for you without giving them, um, uh, um, without asking them. So they had to actively say like, no, 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 you don't have to do that in order to not get the doggy bag. And in the fourth condition, um, she would like before ask them, do you want it in a paper or plastic doggy bag? So again, the same thing. Um, so how many people actually took the doggy bag then? Um, not so many people in the control condition, uh, quite a few more when we, it was a, a choice, when the waiters asked, do you want a doggy bag or not? Uh, even more when the doggy bag was the default and you know, equal to that, not significantly different if they could choose between paper and plastic doggy bag. So that's the same pattern as we saw before. Um, by the way, we had a survey um, roughly a week later but we measured also whether uh, people ate from the doggy bag. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but then we also asked whether they took food home. And it turned out there that there were more people taking food home than had been recorded here as taking a, a doggy bag. So apparently some of the people put some of the food already in their bag and took it home without our research assistant um, being aware of that, which in this setting is quite well possible because you know there were many people in that uh, canteen and she didn't you know, look over everybody's shoulders all the time on purpose because we said you know people have to uh, you know, feel comfortable. Uh, but it, you know it's quite well possible some people put an apple in their bag or some some else of that without actually uh, telling us. We still find that these influence strategies lead. Um, to more uptake of, uh, of taking food home than the control condition, though. So even if we look at those numbers, we, we see uh, uh, that pattern in there. Um, then what is also really interesting to see is the results for the evaluation of the waitress. How much did they like the waitress? So remember from the study that I showed you before that there, if the waitress sort of forced the doggy bag on them, so the blue condition, that they liked the waitress less. See what happens here. This is how much they like the waitress in control, in choice. They like her even better in that condition. So that's the exact opposite result that we got here from the experiment before. That got, got us puzzled a little bit, but we you know, found out what was going on. Um, I've just gotten in the data. We're now writing it up, so I don't have the results on the slide yet. Uh, but what is happening is that um, in the scenario, we had a situation where the waitress unsolicited, so unasked for, uh, gave them uh, a doggy bag with, 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 with the leftovers versus here. It felt differently because the waitress said, oh, I see you have leftovers. I'll put it in a bag for you. And here. And it was given as, as, as almost a gift. So we ran one study with a scenario in which um, the waitress uh, very friendly and with a friendly smile gives you that. And then you're you know, also much happier with the waitress than if she just puts it in a bag and gives it, gives it unsolicited. So the difference here is how the waitress actually um, presents the doggy bag to you. If it's, uh, you know, here you go, or if it's, uh, I've got something for you type of feeling. 
Um, then, of course, finally, what we were really interested in also is what happens to the food. So remember from uh, before when I said uh, the worst thing that could happen is if people, when we you know, force them, force them or influence them to take the doggy back home, that they throw away not just the food but also the bag and the worst of them we started out with. Luckily, that's not the case. If we ask people a week later, have you eaten from the doggy bag? Uh, you know, almost 90% uh, of people in all conditions say, yeah, I ate at least part of the doggy bag. Um, they also say that they still have something in stock, which is very well possible. Um, if you paid attention, uh, but they really had to look carefully at the picture of what was actually in that you know, Dutch lunch. There were these little packs of uh, sandwich spread that can be kept for a long time. So people can still have that in stock and you know, use it later. Um, the reason that we had that is because the restaurant was really worried if you would uh, give people sandwiches with uh, perishable uh, spread that people might, uh, you know, not treat it well. And, and you know, what if somebody thinks even that they got sick from uh, from one of this? So, so we had these non-perishable oh, well, stuff that you could, yeah, non-perishables uh, of for the spreads, and people still had some of that in stock. We also asked if they threw something out. That happened on occasion, but not very often. Uh, and the people who threw everything out, that was just you know, one or two people in each of these conditions, uh, nobody in a control condition. So, um, you know, taking the doggy bag and throwing the food away with the doggy bag barely happened at all. And, you know, most people ate uh, at least part of that doggy bag and maybe kept some things on stock. So that's a positive outcome, of course, that, you know, we can get more people to take home these doggy bags and they'll actually eat from it. So it does diminish overall food waste, not just the plate waste in the restaurant, but across. Them. So then, uh, finally, a short discussion of uh, of this. Um, there's, um, uh, of course, that performing sustainable behavior can induce shame, and it goes against the existing social norm. It's a, as a general uh, you know, indication that's what could happen. Um, if you then provide an explicit choice, that could help, but the effect it seems to be a bit limited. So just uh, as telling to people, saying to people, do you want a doggy bag, yes or no, in this case, but also more, more generally, probably in these situations, if you ask people, um, because the norm is to not do it, you might persuade some people to, to then say yes, but not as many as you may hope for. Uh, so changing to an opt-out is generally more effective. So really... Um, you get this unless you say no. Um, however, sometimes this opt-out strategy can lead to perceived limitations in choice freedom, if it's you know, not done with a smile, basically. Um, and then it could be good to provide these subordinate options, so to opt out with choices in there. Um, that was what I wanted to share with you. I have my contact details on this slide. so. Um, you can uh, you, you then know how to reach me if you want to uh, discuss. We have time to discuss after this, of course, but maybe uh, somebody uh, wants to discuss later on as well. If you're interested in the refresh results, there's the website. And I'm also just briefly wanted to mention that I'm now working on a new project related to food waste, uh, where we're looking more also into the whole um, you know changing or transitioning the food system. Um, interested in how uh, retailing affects uh, uh, household food waste and, and the interface there. Um, so I, uh, yeah, that's what I'm currently working on. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Erika. And um, it's definitely a, a topic that rings uh, a lot of uh, well, bells with the audience, as we've seen in the in the comments and with me as well. Uh, yeah. um, I saw, uh, saw something coming by in the chat, but I didn't have the the time to. No, no, we'll, 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 we'll share some with you indeed, and uh, later on we'll, we'll discuss it. Um, thank you so much. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Anton Gubnitsin uh, from, uh, with his presentation and the point of view from uh, the Russian perspective. Uh, Anton, I see you coming in. Uh, I think it's people. Yeah. Yes. Good evening, Good evening Good evening. colleagues. Anton, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, and I am trying to <clears throat> uh, show my presentation from different screen. Just a second. Um, just a second. 
приглашение Секран. Unfortunately, it does not work yet. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, you, you know what? Unfortunately, it looks like I'm not able to share the screen at the moment. Maybe something will change soon. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Perfect. Great. Perfect. So, sorry for uh, the pause. And uh, Erica, thanks a lot for a really interesting and insightful uh, lecture. By the way, in Russia, in Moscow, and in uh, a dozen of other cities, we do have Doggy Bag. It's the name of food sharing service, which work in a number of uh, cities. Basically, you can download the web uh, application and uh, surprise subscribe for cafeterias you are interested in and book their uh, back with certain food, which um, uh, will come soon to an expiration date. And uh, of course, uh, you can book with a significant discount. So it's an interesting tool. So uh, colleagues, today uh, I will talk about the problem of uh, food waste and the development of food sharing uh, in Russia. Uh, I am Anton Gugnitsyn and I am running TR Center Think Tank, uh, an advisory firm uh, focused on sustainable uh, development uh, and uh, sharing economy in Russia. And I am also running um, sharing economy cluster at the Russian Association of uh, Electronic Communications called TRIAC. It's probably the largest association of digital business in Russia. So, uh, about a year ago, uh, TR Center and RAEC uh, have conducted a research uh, dedicated on the issue of uh, food uh, wastage and the uh, prospects uh, of the uh, food sharing development in Russia. And talking about key findings, you probably can uh, see them uh, on the slide. It's a food wastage. Uh, chain uh, we constructed so basically about uh, 17 million tons of food are uh, thrown out uh, each year in Russia and uh, basically it's quite an impressive uh, figure I must admit and moreover if um, and moreover this figure covers uh, the retail uh, and household sectors and if we take uh, let's say the full chain uh, from the agri agricultural uh, land field, uh, lands uh, to households, the full-scale numbers are twice higher. So basically, it's almost equal to 40% of the Russian food supply flow. Uh, so uh, what does it mean? Um, 17 million tons of wasted food. Maybe um, given the huge size of Russian Federation, it's not a big deal. In the reality, uh, it is a huge amount. First of all, uh, 17 million tons of food uh, waste, uh, 17 million tons of food uh, could uh, easily feed up uh, about 30 million people annually. Uh, I'm talking about uh, adult uh, people. And uh, it's even more than a number of people uh, in Russia living below the poverty line. Because according to Rostat, um, in Russia we have, uh, officially have uh, 20 million people registered as uh, people living below poverty line. Uh, moreover, food waste generates about 80, uh, about 28 percent of all uh, municipal solid waste in Russia. In other words, uh, the stake of uh, food is almost one third in the total volume of all the landfills and garbages. Uh, and uh, there is a kind of social bias, I would say, that uh, food waste is uh, less uh, harmful or even harmless because it's kind of biodegradable waste. In the meantime, it's important to understand that food waste pollutes the soil, water, and air. Uh, and for instance, uh, these 17 million, million tons of food waste is a source of about 2.4 million tons of uh, methane uh, emissions, which is uh, quite a uh, significant greenhouse gas. 
And uh, thirdly, talking about uh, market price, uh, the market price of wasted food is more than 1.6 trillion rubles, and it's equal to 1.6% uh, uh, of Russian GDP. Uh, just think about it, uh, about 40% of food losses and food waste in overall food supply chain uh, in the country. Uh, it's not only about food waste losses, it's also about uh, wasted time, labor force, agricultural lands, uh, transportation, storage, etc., etc. And uh, as you may understand, uh, somebody should compensate all these losses. And indeed, uh, it will be us, the consumers, who pays the price of the products on the store shelf. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, we also built um, top three of the products uh, generating uh, the most of uh, food waste in the country. Uh, and top three are, first of all, baked goods and uh, different kinds of cereals, then dairy products like uh, milk, cheese, etc. And finally, vegetables. And uh, if we would imagine uh, that we would nullify losses in these three categories, uh, the amount of food waste uh, could fall by almost 70%. Um, that's, uh, would be, that would be a really uh, significant uh, progress. So the problem of uh, food waste and food loss is simultaneously social, ecological, and uh, economical. Uh, the, so it's kind of complex nature of the problem. Why is social? Because those who are in need could receive food for free. In the meantime, 70 million tons of uh, food go to landfills annually. And at the same time, the state provides welfare payments to vulnerable people uh, to make food for them more affordable. Let's call it quite an efficient way of using uh, the resources. Uh, it's also an environmental problem. I already uh, mentioned uh, to you that uh, about one third of oral uh, waste landfills in Russia is food. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Russian government invests uh, annually billions of uh, rubles into the recultivation of uh, waste landfills. Just imagine that there would be a solution uh, that uh, could um, lower the volume of landfills by 30%. This would be also, um, as a main of consequences, would be a decreasing of state uh, funding required to this area. And uh, why the food waste is an economic issue, I already briefly mentioned, because basically price of the food uh, reflects the effectiveness of its production, right? And uh, at some point reducing the food losses and food waste could all, uh, even contain the growth of uh, the market prices. And obviously it would be a great step towards rational use of resources. Uh, and uh, as you probably already understand and see, uh, all the problems I just listed, they are directly connected to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So they address such global challenges as hunger, as reduction of uh, inequality, uh, responsible consumption and production, and obviously the climate uh, action. So these are the priorities of the um, successful development of the global economy and I would say international community. So uh, let's talk about the uh, solution of the problems I uh, indicated. Um, and one of the solutions is food sharing. Uh, food sharing is a, a set of online services where about to expire food is made available for people to eat. Basically, food sharing tools uh, permit users uh, to post information about food products uh, in stock and uh, about the quantity and location. Uh, the simplest format of peer-to-peer -peer, um, food sharing uh, services might be imagined as a page in a social network where people could easily post uh, info about food uh, they are ready to donate. 
uh, and basically the idea of food sharing is to make uh, an easy way uh, of food re redistribution from those who have unnecessary food to those who are in need. And by doing that, food sharing prevents food waste. Uh, so we can say that food sharing uh, basically provides mobility uh, for food. Uh, and its role is to make it easy to donate and easy to uh, receive uh, food. Mm, and uh, also it is important to think about the topic that basically food sharing teaches us how to consume everything that uh, we produced without enormous losses we have at the moment. Uh, talking about <clears throat> Uh, food sharing in the uh, in Russia, I should say that uh, it currently on the initial initial stage of development. Uh, according to our estimates, the existing mm, food sharing uh, services save only uh, mm, about seven uh, or nine thousand tons of food. This figure uh, it's only zero point zero. 4% of the early uh, uh, annual food waste amount, right? So you can see it uh, on the slide. Uh, in fact, 7,000 tons, right? Uh, and uh, if uh, we analyze these uh, 7,000 tons of food saved uh, by food sharing services, we will see that most of these uh, food, about 6,000 tons, is saved, uh, saved thanks to the work of Food Bank Rus. It's the uh, biggest food sharing service and NGO which works with uh, uh, major food producers. And uh, apart from that, uh, other organizations such as foodsharing.ru, uh, uh, the uh, group in the social network of Kontakte, uh, the group called Adam Yedudaram, or basically Food for Free, uh, all together they uh, save about 1,000 tons of food per year. And besides that, uh, there are uh, commercial services. I already mentioned Doggy Bag. It's one of the um, commercial services. Another uh, quite uh, visible is a service uh, called Eat Me. It's a uh, mobile ap application from St. Petersburg, which enables people to buy um, unsold food uh, from restaurants and cafes with a significant discount, like 50-80%. Uh, basically, there are various uh, models of food sharing, and you can see the logos of the main uh, food sharing services uh, working in Russia on the slide. Uh, and there is enough space, obviously, for their coexistence because they are all useful. Uh, so, according to our <clears throat> calculations, Russia is capable uh, to achieve the annual volume of uh, saved food in the amount of 1 million tons per year. Uh, we believe it would be possible to achieve uh, developing food sharing in Russia in the nearest like 3-4 years. Uh, and obviously it would be massive achievements uh, but obviously here is the question, so why we are not uh, there yet and why the scope of food sharing in Russia is currently um, so small. Uh, several uh, reasons for that. First of all, certainly it's about regulatory environment and regulatory barriers. Uh, I believe it's the most substantial problem. Uh, and uh, another factor is the uh, is that food waste prevention is still not a part of our behavior, neither behavior of people nor behavior, behavior of most the companies, retailers or pr food producers. So talking about uh, regulatory issues, uh, did you know that uh, there is a tax burden on food donated to charity uh, organizations, uh, including non-for-profit food sharing organizations. For instance, if a company um, uh, would like to donate certain food uh, to an NGO, uh, it has to pay income tax and VAT. Uh, 
so altogether, these taxes might be up to 40% uh, from the market price of the product. So just think about it, who is going to make donations and pay 40% of taxes. Uh, some of the companies are doing that, but uh, obviously it's quite a few companies, and it's I would say it's um, remarkable act. Um, so uh, I must admit that today uh, it's more economically reasonable for companies to recycle food rather than donate this food for charity. Uh, and to be fair, uh, it, I must admit that uh, there were some positive changes in the area of legislation uh, in June 2020, uh, portionally due to coronavirus uh, pandemic, portionally due to the efforts of uh, Food Bank Rus, uh, the amendments to the Russian tax code, uh, code uh, were uh, finally uh, signed and now companies donating food uh, to charity are able to get tax exemption from the income tax. Um, the tax income uh, exception for uh, donated food uh, with a certain threshold, uh, basically the limit is 1% of the company's revenue, but still it's a good uh, progress. Um, now we still have the VAT problem the VAT uh, tax burden for the food donation uh, and hopefully uh, this um, issue will be resolved uh, in a positive way also in uh, if not this year I hope I believe in the next year another uh, regulatory issue in the uh, country is the existing sanitary and uh, epidemiological requirements they are also bring certain challenges for the food sharing development. Uh, for instance, you cannot uh, sell fruits or vegetables uh, with a breakdown skin, even if uh, these fruits or vegetables are normal and eatable. Uh, moreover, the same problem with uh, packed food uh, which have certain labeling typos. For instance, if a company or uh, grocery store has a box of cookies, which uh, such a defect with a labeling typo, they uh, have to throw it away. They cannot sell it. And obviously it's ridiculous because if you cannot sell these products by safety reasons, uh, or some regulatory reasons, uh, you still can donate this uh, food because, again, it's legal, safe, and just normal. Uh, these are just typos. Um, the good news uh, that food producers in Russia and retail chains uh, today are coming uh, to understanding uh, of their role uh, in the promotion of uh, reduction of waste, uh, food waste. Um, in the meantime, still, uh, currently, uh, we should rather talk about good examples rather than trends uh, in the consumer behavior and uh, business behavior. Uh, so, uh, when we published this report the, the, with these uh, quite Mm, impressive figures. Uh, we've got quite significant media response and uh, we saw several hundreds of articles in Russian media about uh, the food waste problem and uh, food sharing uh, potential in Russia. But what is more important that uh, this publicity formed a real interest uh, from the business uh, side, uh, interest to cooperation with food, food sharing services. Uh, some of the um, uh, food sharing services where I in contact with, they informed me that in a couple of months after we published the research, uh, the number of their partners, I mean donors, companies who donate food, uh, the number of their partners increased uh, five times. Uh, you can imagine that it's just uh, huge uh, scale up from all scratch. Yeah, it is almost uh, um, unbelievable that cafes, restaurants, and some grocery stores just discovered that there is a tool which allows them to prevent food waste 
and they immediately started to use this tool despite to all the regulatory problems I just mentioned to you. Uh, and this fact um, inspired uh, our team at TR Center to continue this work, and we decided to launch a number of projects which uh, would facilitate the development of food sharing in Russia. So, uh, first of all, we've launched uh, the informational project One Million Tons, uh, One Million Tons uh, .ru. Uh, there at the website, we aggregated all the information about the main food sharing services working in Russia. And besides that, uh, we provide news, aggregate news and analytical uh, pieces on food uh, saving efforts in the country. And uh, now I believe almost everybody can uh, find uh, appropriate food sharing service uh, which meets uh, his or her specific needs. Mm, um, second, uh, this month uh, we are launching a Telegram chatbot uh, devoted to food sharing. It's also uh, the chatbot also called One Million Tons. The idea is to help uh, individuals to find the food uh, they need in the location uh, they want. It's about peer-to-peer -peer food sharing. As I already mentioned, uh, currently peer-to-peer -peer food sharing mainly works as a groups in social networks. And as a consequence, uh, there is a problem that uh, users receive a lot of information they are not able to use and they don't need, for instance, uh, food which is not relevant for them or food uh, which is available at distant locations. And uh, as you understand, the post about the food donation are not structured well, because sometimes it's just photo you know, or a couple of words. And uh, even to name the bread in Russian language, you can use хлеб, булка, baton, etc., etc. So it's difficult to search. Uh, and uh, the bot, uh, chat bot in Telegram, will allow users to choose categories uh, of food they are interested in uh, and get alerts only on the new posts in their geolocation. And basically the idea is to intensify and speed up the process of food sharing among individuals. Um, uh, of course, uh, it is not we, uh, TR Center, who developed this uh, tool. I mean, chatbot, uh, we worked with IT specialists. Uh, and basically, we just presented this case, the idea uh, at a federal hackathon. It's, uh, let's say, hackathon, it's a marathon for hackers, let's call it this way. Uh, the hackathon called Digital Breakthrough or Цифровой Прорыв. Uh, presented the case and several uh, IT teams developed their solution for this task and I hope that uh, soon, uh, probably this year, we'll see several options for such a chatbot in Telegram um, successfully launched uh, in Russia and I hope that at least that uh, some of them will work well. Um, and. Uh, Currently, we are helping one of the food sharing volunteers group uh, to register an NGO and develop all the necessary documentation to work uh, in food sharing uh, area in accordance with all legal requirements. And basically, final thought, uh, as you understand digitalization, uh, digitalization is a very important factor of scaling up of food sharing in Russia and uh, in all other countries. Uh, you can see uh, the success story of food tech companies in Russia. Food delivery services are booming now. Mobile solutions allow us uh, to get food from cafes, from uh, stores in a very prompt manner. And now I believe it's time to use all this experience to scale up and speed up the food sharing in Russia because 17 million tons uh, of food uh, can be in my view, quite easily distributed uh, among people um, and uh, can be consumes, consumed uh, instead of going to landfills. So I believe, my friends, that today's seminar, uh, seminar will motivate you um, to think about food waste prevention in your uh, households and maybe even about launching your food sharing service in your city. 
So thanks a lot for your uh, attention and I will be glad to receive your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Anton. And I think the first question that was posed in the, or that you should, if you can answer it already, is uh, what is the name of the Telegram channel um, uh, that is uh, that you have uh, available? Uh, see, my lighting is a little bit off. I'm sorry for that. I'm sitting in a dark room and I don't have another light. Um, Anton, thank you very much. Erika, thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue now with uh, a Q&A, uh, but I want to give Erika maybe first the uh, opportunity, if she wants, to react on what Anton has said and maybe give some of her thoughts, if she would like to. Okay. Um, well, first, thanks a lot for the uh, presentation, Anton. It's uh, very inspiring to see what is going on in, in Russia and what the steps are that are being taken. Um, I, I see that there are lots of similarities with what I also see uh, in here in the Netherlands and in other countries. Uh, we also have the food sharing apps and the um, the, the, the uh, apps that, that provide food. But what we have here, and I'm not sure if you also have that in Russia, is that uh, the main food sharing app where companies can post their leftovers actually has surprise boxes. Um, the app's called Too Good To Go. So what people do is that they can sign up for a box of whatever is left uh, and close to expiration in that store by the end of the day, but they don't know in advance what it will be. And to me, that adds a certain element to it that might be uh, interesting for some people, but not so much for others. So I don't know how you feel about that, but I was kind of curious if that's something that you've also come across. Yes, uh, yeah, and as I uh, mentioned, basically we do have such a service, at least I know about one of uh, these services and it's called exactly Doggy Bag. So it's about surprise, you can take it and subscribe with a good discount. Um, and I think it's useful, it works and it covers this problem, but covers it obviously portionally. Because still, uh, I feel like um, uh, the main component of the uh, food waste uh, problem in Russia, uh, it's a social problem. Because again, a lot of people who are in need, uh, who would uh, grab this food because uh, they are not able to buy it, right? Uh, and uh, doggy bag, it's an interesting solution, but for uh, definitely for a different social group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see. Yeah. Jelena, do you want to pose the question? Um, yes, actually, I think that uh, there is um, a question that can be um, sort of uh, derived from the chats that we already have a lot of comments there is uh, actually both the um, unprotected and poor people who would actually have no access to mobile phones or laptops or PCs, etc. So they won't be able to benefit from the services that you mentioned. So is there any solution uh, that can be offered for um, these categories of people so that they do have access to uh, the foods mm -hmm. and to the food sharing services as such. Uh, yep, uh, uh, there is a solution, uh, and the solution is Food Bank Rus. Uh, I already mentioned this name. Basically, uh, it has the biggest share uh, in the amount of saved food, and basically, it works as a classical or classical slash virtual um, food bank, which means that uh, they cooperate with the food uh, producers and retailers, uh, uh, take this food and then distribute among NGOs and charity organizations. And each of these charity organizations uh, has um, a certain uh, groups of vulnerable people they're helping to. So basically the mobile phone or laptop is not necessary in this um, theme. And <clears throat> why, in the meantime, why I am stressing the importance of the digi digitalization of um, food sharing, um, simply because it, um, uh, the gives, uh, it gives us the new scale, the new level of uh, the activities, I mean, if we are just uh, taking manually food from one place to another. It's kind of a uh, long way, yeah. And the whole uh, game uh, with and the whole challenge with the food that it has the expiration date, and it's important for us 
to distribute and consume the food before the expiration date and uh, expiring date and i uh, should uh, highlight that when we are talking about food sharing we're only talking about the kind of legal food with uh, uh, the um, um, uh, w w not expired food yeah but close to uh, that date yeah uh, I think what we see actually also from the comments and um, uh, from both your uh, lectures, which really uh, well complement each other, is that we're talking about a lot of uh, issues at the same time. Uh, we're talking about food food waste is the, is the main driver, but food waste, as we have seen, is done throughout the whole chain. So starting from uh, building it on, on, the, on the farms up until the consumers. And we've seen that consumers are the biggest uh, food wasters uh, in the chain. Um, um, to start with, with Erika, in your research, uh, how much, uh, so what is the, the total effect of um, what you would like to achieve uh, in your research of people uh, wasting less food? Uh, so what is, uh, what is the, the, the biggest drive there then? And are you also involved in, 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 in trying to understand what are the other uh, stakeholders uh, uh, obligations perhaps uh, towards food waste? Yes, so um, of course we're also interested in other stakeholders and in the whole chain and um, what I'm mainly interested in is especially that link between retailers and consumers because retailers have uh, a lot of power in the chain and, and if we can change things there then you know, that, that could have trickle down effects. And in response to the first part of your question about you know most of the food waste being done in home um, we're also looking at how we can uh, diminish that. So one of the uh, studies that we've done and, and where we'll do follow-ups is where we send people a package with tools to their home um, to diminish food waste. So that had different things like a measurement cup that you could use to measure pasta and rice, but not in grams, but in actual uh, portion sizes. Uh, it's a D Dutch uh, nutrition center that, that has these things. So the measurement cup, we had stickers for fridge and freezer of what goes into the fridge, what doesn't. Um, there were you know, all these sorts of, of, of tools of recipes to cook with uh, leftovers. Uh, and then uh, what we see is that if you ask people beforehand how much they waste in a week and then we let them use it for a while and ask them again, we see a huge um, uh, diminishment of the self-reported food waste, about 40%. So that's a lot. But I want to do some follow-up work where we're um, actually going to dive into their uh, actual waste um, and, and sort out what amount of food they're wasting, just to know for sure that it's not just you know social desirability or people saying that they waste less, on that, but, but how much actually is going on. Um, we also see um, that just the mere asking people to report to what how much they waste already leads to effects because they're um, suddenly aware of how much they're wasting. Um, so asking people to keep a diary, but even just asking them to report the food waste from, you know, keeping track of it and reporting it from the past week can influence people's behavior. Yeah. Um, so there's a scientific challenge there on how to measure so that uh, people are uh, not changing their behavior based on the measurement, but yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think we also see that, um, um, uh, how do you call this uh, um, uh, education, uh, but also giving attention to the topic uh, raises uh, attention with, with the people. And what Anton also mentioned with their research, suddenly a lot of companies became interested. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and um, Anton, to your mind, are you, are you, are you collaborating for, with, with, with universities, for example, also in Russia, um, uh, dealing with this topic? Uh, is, how high is it on the agenda uh, within uh, the Russian government, for example, because you've mentioned a lot of the economic effects also, which are pretty big. Would you share something about that? Uh, yeah, we, we do collaborate with the universities. I In Russia, with the leading uh, universities here in Moscow, in the meantime, mainly on the projects not related to food uh, uh, waste issue and food sharing. Uh, as for the government uh, interest, I do see a lot of attention to that topic. And again, just to balance the picture, I see the positive changes because again, at least we uh, all together managed to advocate for the improvement of the situation with the tax burden for those who donate food. It's already 
great result. Before last year, uh, it was 40% of tax a company shall pay when donate food. Now it's like up to 20. It's already twice better situation, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and uh, I see that a lot of politicians are interested to use this, at least in the public agenda. Uh, of course, there is a part of uh, PR around that, but still, I do believe that in this situation, the PR is also useful because it still articulates the issue and uh, will help to resolve it at some point. Yeah. Uh, may, may I pose the same question and then, Yelena, maybe you can get a question also from the audience. But the question to Erika then, how high is this on the agenda in the Netherlands? Or is there a collaboration within the European Union on this uh, topic? Yeah, it's, it's quite high on the agenda also throughout uh, Europe. Uh, EU is looking into this uh, issue as well, also uh, setting up uh, funds for research uh, programs uh, related to the issue. Um, we've seen that uh, interest in, in, in policy, but also in academics, uh, academia has risen a lot over, the, I'd say, past 10 years or so. Um, you can see it also in publications, if you go back, like how many papers are being published on the topic, um, then it's really spiked up. And you see the same thing, or you get the same sense if you talk to uh, policymakers that it's much higher on the agenda than it used to be, because it has so many uh, consequences also. Um, there are studies showing that if you do life cycle analysis of how much um, uh, you know impact there is for the environment from wasting, for instance, a plastic packaging or wasting the food that's inside, then the food has a much higher impact. So saving the food can have a lot of positive consequences, not just for, you know, having good nutrition for people, but also uh, environmental uh, consequences. Thank you. Y Yelena. Yeah, um, so basically the next question is uh, derives from uh, several comments as the previous one. Uh, so basically uh, the main um, idea of this is that our people in Russia, because I'm coming back to Russia since um, uh, we share um, the interest with the Russian audience mostly. Uh, so sometimes people cannot, um, see, um, they are simply unable to measure how much they actually need, how much food they actually need. So they, um, so after the USSR uh, years, when we had um, uh, less products uh, than we have now and less access to uh, maybe some import export etc um, so be, uh, basically sometimes we're faced with the overconsumption and uh, coming back to the uh, question that uh, Jirka already mentioned about the education and asked you Anton that uh, whether or not you collaborate with the universities and my question and the question from um, mostly uh, Mrs. Svetlana Sokolova uh, which is mentioned in the chat um, is basically do you have any educational programs to uh, that are aimed at, for example, younger generations, because uh, you, of course, you know that uh, the uh, Russian behavior is not uh, a stranger to saving food, because basically our older generations, our grandmothers and even mothers, um, are used to uh, cook from left uh, uh, cook from leftovers, sorry, and uh, save a lot of foods, uh, making some cons uh, preservatives, etc. Um, so, um, and uh, now I think we uh, face uh, uh, rather the opposite issue that we are uh, we are over consumption and buy a lot and buy more than we actually um, uh, can consume. So, do you aim at that? And if so, uh, what are the uh, programs and to whom they are okay. aimed? Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I really don't know about the current program educational programs uh, at the universities on that topic in the meantime i do believe that uh, there are two main important educational streams which probably even more important uh, at the current stage first educational stream uh, which uh, i believe should come from the retail side basically from the points of sale uh, yeah, and it should be targeted not only to the younger generation, but for all the consumers, because uh, retail and some of them already are doing that. Uh, they are trying to educate people now. Um, some of the retail chains are at the stage uh, on educating when they educating people uh, how to choose the the products packed in the relatively environmental uh, friendly packaging right for instance you take fukus wheel or x5 uh, etc they are paying attention to that and i do believe that this will give certain result 
I think that responsible consumption is the next step. And again, I do believe that points of sales is one of the most um, important uh, areas where people uh, should get the information. And second, uh, it's the social networks, uh, environmental activism, etc. If you go to Instagram, Facebook, other social networks, you and if you are interested in that topic, you would easily find people who are basically trying to inspire you uh, by personal example. Uh, I see a lot of people who are launching online courses for those who are interested in responsible consumption, etc. And I do believe it's also uh, useful uh, and uh, developing rapidly developing a stream of education. Thank you. Eric, a question to you actually. Uh, what about spreading news among, for example, uh, elementary or primary secondary school uh, students? Yes, there are yeah. education programs. Oh, I hear a big echo now, sorry. There, there are uh, education programs being uh, uh, set up and, 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 and being active. Actually, um, what may also be good to realize is that the issue that's being raised here is not only uh, in, in Russia, we also see it in other countries. For instance, in our focus groups in, in Spain, uh, the same thing came up that, you know, throughout the generations, people have educated the, their children and grandchildren about how to treat food well, uh, but that seems to have diminished. Um, so that, that issue of that education, um, uh, natural education throughout the generation seems to be gone or diminishing. Um, another thing, I, I totally agree with Anton about, um, you know, the point of sales and the social media. What we also see is some uh, cooks or chefs on social media um, also sharing how they, uh, um, you know, prepare food that, that with minimal waste. Um, how you can also uh, eat parts of the, 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 the vegetables or some things that you didn't expect that you were able to eat maybe. So um, that's also a way to educate people and to reach people. Yeah, as a, as, as a roundup, uh, because we're nearing the, 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 uh, the end of our session, uh, I think I would like to ask you both of you, Anton and Erika, since uh, you're so much into the topic, I assume that your households are not wasting uh, any food uh, whatsoever. Uh, you have smart and good solutions uh, for all of it. Um, and we have also seen from the comments, and thank you very much, uh, dear attendees, uh, for, for doing this, that it's, it's also been a little bit problematic because not everybody knows, of course, how to solve these problems. What would be your biggest advice? What should we uh, do to help reduce food waste? And what is your personal best tip? Here you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the reason that I got interested, I'm, I'm going to give you a short anecdote before I answer. The reason that I got interested in food waste, um, which is more than 10 years ago, was when I was listening to a presentation of a, uh, a professor um, talking about his own research in food waste and saying that he um, knew how bad it was, but still found himself wasting food uh, regularly. Uh, and then he went on with a whole economic theory on how that could be rational. I was thinking like, no, if you know that that's not good and you're trying to, then there's other things going on. That's got me interested. But it also shows that um, it's not so easy to have zero waste. Uh, um, so uh, in response to your, you, you must waste nothing. I can't honestly say that I don't waste anything. Um, what I think helped us in our household a lot, um, two things. One is opportunities. So uh, putting a toaster in the, on the counter so that any uh, bread that, that we have left goes into the toaster and gets eaten. Um, just having that available there, easy to use, that, that helps. And the other thing is, contrary to what you might expect, is not planning too much and going to the supermarket often. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to do research to see whether that's actually a good idea because there's also the other side that if you make meal plans and plan everything perfectly, that might also work. But for our household, that didn't quite work. And for us, just you know, buying what we need for the next day or maybe two days, but not more than that, and then going in and, and using our leftovers, that really helps. Yeah. Anton? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, personally, uh, my rule is quite 
simple and uh, doable. I'm just buying food exactly in the amount uh, I need and my family need. And honestly, I don't even see this as a kind of personal challenge or uh, challenge for our family. Um, Personally, it might be that uh, connected uh, that uh, to, to the topic that uh, these days uh, not all people uh, cook at home at the uh, significant amount. So it's still uh, at least portionally about food waste in restaurants, in cafeterias, etc., and portionally in households. And uh, talking about the kind of <clears throat> uh, the main goal, the desire, and dream, um, I would uh, definitely talk about the um, um, f- engagement in the food uh, sharing. Um, of the main retail chains and food producers, because I do believe that we could, we could uh, significantly improve the situation with the food waste, and we could prevent a lot of uh, waste and food losses. Just uh, we are <clears throat> helping the companies to save food and distribute it, and it's also might be one of the most uh, important areas for the charity and social responsibility programs because they it's their direct uh, area of responsibility to mm, donate uh, food if they produce it right and help those who are in need uh, help uh, vulnerable people yeah mm-hmm. yeah Thank you very much. And I'm just seeing also in the, in the chat, uh, there are uh, people also commenting that uh, there are these apps uh, coming up. And I, I like the idea actually, Anton, of the of the chatbot uh, where you can connect also locally and ge- in, with the geolocation. I don't know such an app in the Netherlands. It might be an idea for this. Uh, there's tons of initiatives with that. I completely agree. Uh, people, if you search for them, then you will find them. Uh, I think it's a, yeah, what I mean, it's a problem that we uh, create ourselves and that we have to solve ourselves. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Van Herpen and Anton Gudnitsin very much uh, for your uh, participation in tonight's uh, lecture. Very, uh, yeah, again, important topic, and I think we just need to repeat it in one year and see where we are at, uh, at that stage. Uh, dear attendees, thank you for joining us uh, again for the Dutch uh, Science Talks. Uh, Jelena and myself are very happy uh, that you're with us. Um, we have more Dutch Science Talks coming up. A uh, recording of this lecture will be available, and we will share information uh, with you, uh, uh, share the presentations. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have uh, questions uh, to uh, Erika and Anton, they're easily to find actually uh, online also. Um, so you can uh, ask questions uh, there. Thank you once more, Anton and Erika. We'll be in touch via email uh, still. And um, I wish everybody a very nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.